19. He who makes a beast of himself gets rid of the pain of being a man. Samuel Johnson. Coraline. Day 1. Ah! I screamed at the top of my lungs as a rush of freezing cold water was poured all over me and my bed. Jumping out of bed, I came face to face with Adriana, I believe. She looked like I was an annoying brat. You're late. She stared, placing the bucket on the ground. It is six in the morning, I yelled at her, shivering horribly. Why in the world couldn't she just shake me like a normal person? Training starts an hour before sunrise. The sun is up, which means you're late. She walked to my closet, pulled out two random items of clothing that didn't even match, then threw them at me. I didn't strip. What? She wanted me to change in front of her. She rolled her eyes and pointed to my pajamas. Take off your clothes and get changed so you can start the training you begged the boss for. Okay. Let me just go to the bathroom. Why, do you have special lady parts that I don't have? She glared at me. I don't remember you being this mouthy to Mel. What was that? She asked, making me jump. Nothing. These clothes don't match. I replied, walking over to my closet. Adriana followed, of course. Does it matter what clothes you bleed in? Bleed in. There is a reason why people say that they work through blood, sweat, and tears. She rolled her eyes, making me feel like an idiot. I wasn't doing this to feel even worse about myself. Look, I'm new at this whole being strong, being confident, being a fucking Callahan. Yes, I'm getting that. Which is why I'm annoyed, because this isn't you. Or at least it shouldn't be you. Aren't black women supposed to be strong? You don't know me, you racist bitch! I yelled at her. Yes, I was supposed to be the typical black woman, the one who takes no shit and is ready to fight at any moment. God forbid there be a black woman who was shy, who hated confrontation, who didn't fit the stereotype. She smirked, pushing her glasses up her small nose. Nope, I don't know you, but do you know you? Is this meek small woman in front of me the real Coraline, or is it the face you put on because you're scared to deal with your shit? I wasn't sure how to respond to that. Think about why you asked to do this. You could have chosen another way to remake yourself, to better yourself. You could have gone back to school, lost five pounds, wrote a self-help book. But instead, you wanted to learn how to fight. People who choose that option are born differently than the rest of the world. She stepped right up to my face, and I felt the need to back away. There is a drive, a hunger within you, Coraline. You're trying to break out of your shell, but you are scared to do so. You're scared because all you know how to do is hide behind sick children and big fat checks. You hide behind everything, even your clothes. It's why you can't take them off in front of others. Let me guess, you and Declan have sex in the dark. You hide and wait under the covers. Shut the fuck up! I yelled, my fist flying at her fast. However, she caught it easily and smiled. There's the real Coraline breaking out. Maybe you aren't hopeless. We'll try again tomorrow, and you better not be late. She glared before walking away from me. When she left, I felt myself fall. I just lay down in my closet. Who was the real Coraline Wilson Callahan? I wasn't sure. My whole life was unsure, with the exception of Declan. He was the silver lining in my life. Neither of my parents wanted anything to do with me, seeing as how they weren't really my parents. They were my very bitter aunt and uncle. After my real parents died, they took me in, hoping they could get the money that was left to me. They didn't care about me, and they were pissed off when they found out only I could withdraw anything and not until my sixteenth birthday. They never said a kind word to me as a child, and then on my sixteenth birthday, they were taking me on shopping trips. More like I was taking them. But they were happy and they treated me better, so I kept buying. Now here I was at twenty-two still trying to buy affection. But it didn't work so well when everyone around you had just as much money, if not more. I didn't know who the real me was. But I knew I wanted to kill this Coraline. Not all of her, just most of her. I wanted to be who I was when I first met Declan. Free, alive, happy. I wasn't sure when I lost it. I think it was just a few months after we got married. I saw a darker side of him, and I got nervous. I became afraid and walled myself off from him. The more blood I saw, the more wounds he came back with, the more I walked away. Which was stupid, because he confessed on our third date who he was and what he did. 
He told me he loved me enough to let me walk away. He said if we went on one more date, he wouldn't be able to handle it if I left him. I didn't want to leave him, so I stayed. And then I kicked him in the gut for it later. I accepted this life, and I didn't want it to rule me. I wanted to walk on the same water Mel and Evelyn did. Evelyn would walk through fire for Cedric. She would kill for him, and I wanted to be that way. I wanted to be a real Callahan woman. Day Two I walked straight into Adriana's room to find her placing knives on her bed. She looked up at me, then to the time, and smiled. Four thirty in the morning, I'm impressed. Ready for the blood, sweat, and tears? She asked. Yes. Twenty. Maybe this is why so many serial killers work in pairs. It's nice to not feel alone in a world full of victims or enemies. It just seems natural. You and me against the world. Chuck Polinick. Melody. I couldn't stop shaking. Me. Motherfucking Melody Giovanni, now fucking Callahan, the girl who didn't blink when she sold her first ounce of coke at sixteen in a back alleyway. I was the girl who murdered a cartel member at seventeen because he stole a pound of weed from us. However, here I was, and I could not stop shaking. I did not shake. I did not bend. I did not fucking flinch at the sight of blood, drugs, or at the sound of a fucking bullet. Yet here I was, watching as one of Cascadia's doctors looked over Liam, and I was bloody shaking. What the hell was wrong with me? I was trying my best not to scream at the fool hovering over Liam, who hadn't moved in nine hours. If it weren't for his chest rising and falling, I would have thought he was... This stupid doctor has five seconds to give me an update, or I was going to reach up and pull his tongue out of his ass. Mrs. Callahan. You're wasting words, I hissed. How is he? He's fine. Luckily, the bullet wasn't lethal. In fact, I'm not sure exactly what it was. He has two bruised ribs, but they will heal. He's on medication for the pain, but other than that, he is fine and should get back to moving around in a couple of days. He replied, stepping back when I moved to the edge of the bed. Liam looked so peaceful. There wasn't a wrinkle or any discomfort in his face. I felt the urge to run my hands through his hair. Part of me wanted to lay with him. A big part of me wanted to lay with him. It was like my mind knew that was the only way the shaking would stop. However, I couldn't. Instead, I turned around and walked out the door. Knowing he was okay, knowing he would be fine, meant that I could do what I had been itching to do from the moment Fidel came to me. I stepped outside, allowing my eyes to roam the yard of men who were all waiting for the same update I had been. My gaze stopped at the fools, and it was like the lion was out of the cage. Neil! I roared, causing every man in his right fucking mind to part like the fucking Red Sea as I walked to him. He didn't move. He didn't even look surprised, but in a moment he was going to look like he was in a hell of a lot of pain. Before I could get to him, Declan blocked my path and grabbed my arm. Who did this motherfucking bitch think he was? Melody! Before he could finish, I punched him straight in the throat, kicked his back legs so they buckled, and brought him to his knees. Grabbing his hair, I yanked it back and pressed my knife to his neck. I will end you, Declan Callahan, if you ever stand in my way again. I pressed the blade even harder against his Adam's apple. You aren't thinking clearly. He didn't seem to get that I wasn't fucking joking. Pulling the knife from his neck, I stabbed his shoulder. His eyes widened as I backed away, allowing him to fall to his ass before letting out a roar of pain. Have you lost your fucking mind? Neil yelled at me, rushing towards Declan. However, I stood in front of him. Yes, because if I was fucking sane right now, if I was Melody Giovanni instead of Callahan, I would have fucking killed him for stepping in my way. But I can't kill Liam's cousin and his brother in the same day, I yelled. He looked me over, unsure of what to do or even say. I would help him find his tongue. Did you shoot Liam? I knew the answer, but I wanted to hear him say it. Melody. Did you fucking shoot my husband, Neil? Yes. I felt a moment of peace before I found myself lunging at his neck. He saw it coming. He grabbed hold of my arms and lifted me as if I was a fucking newborn. Melody, it was an accident. He yelled, but look at what long legs I have, only to strangle him with. I wrapped them around his neck like a python and squeezed until he had to let my arms go to grab hold of my legs. When he did, I flipped off him and kneed him in the crotch. He bent down and the stupid, tall, bear-like motherfucker gasped in pain. You, Neil Callahan, are the accident. My fist smashed into his face. His head jerked, and I felt the pain in my hand, but I didn't stop. You, Neil Callahan, are scum. 
You do not deserve my respect. Another punch in the fucking nose. You do not deserve your last name. At that he grabbed my fist, stopping it before spitting the blood from his mouth and rising to his feet. He glared into my eyes and his own were burning. Watch yourself, sister, or you may get hurt. He did his best to tower over me, as if he was trying to say something with his sighs. What, because you choose steroids for breakfast, I should be afraid of you? I spun into him so quickly he didn't have time to comprehend what I was doing until it was too late. It was one of the few things I had learned from my failed attempts at dance lessons as a child. Let your partner lead. It was probably why I failed at it. I did the leading. However, it worked for Neil, who was too big to stop me from spinning into him and grabbing his gun before spinning out. With my left finger, I pulled the fucking trigger. Sadly, it wasn't a gun, but a taser. However, it worked, and 80,000 volts sent him straight to his ass, shaking like a fish out of water. A taser? Really? What are you, a mall cop? I sighed, looking down at him, but the big bad wolf couldn't speak. Bending on one knee, I leaned in so he could see my eyes. If you ever cause harm to Liam again, I will cut you in half and stuff you inside of a locker. Standing back up, I turned to look over the rest of the men. Mine were all smiling, while the rest looked proud. I guess they didn't like their boss being shot either. He's fine. Just needs rest. Continue on pretending like you are not trying to kill each other. I'll see you all later. I told them, and my eyes met Declan's. He was being held up by none other than Eric, who I was starting to dislike. Declan looked pale and in need of a drink. He would be fine. If not, well then, boo fucking who. I'll send for the doctor, I said in a mocking tone, and then walked past them and into the cabin. The doctor looked at me, unsure of what to do or where to go. Fidel will handle your payment after you look over Neil and Declan, I told him, taking off my boots. My hand was sore, but I would deal with that later. He must have noticed because he stepped forward, but I glared at him. There was only one doctor I trusted, and it wasn't him. Getting the message, he left quickly, leaving me alone with the handsome, sleeping asshole who was my husband. Once again, I found myself staring at him. He looked beautiful, and I gave in to my need, allowing my good hand to run through his hair. When he let out a small moan, I stopped. Even in his sleep, he was a horn dog. He was definitely all right. Smiling to myself like an idiot, I stripped down as I walked towards the bathroom, grabbing myself a bottle of brandy as I did. Turning on the shower, I waited until the water was hot, which would take a moment. It was one of the downsides with camp. Drinking from the bottle, I allowed myself a second to stare in the mirror. Most people hated to look at themselves. They always found a flaw within the person they looked at. However, I never had that problem. I knew I was attractive. I knew I was smart. I wasn't looking hard enough, though, not until Liam shoved a metaphorical mirror so close to my face that my nose was touching the glass. It was only then that I truly saw that in many ways he was right. I was alone, and I was lonely. I had always accepted that, and I had made sure to never think about it. It wasn't until we were in the forest that I actually understood it. Losing Orlando hurt underneath everything, even when I saw that coming. Liam, though, that bullet. I didn't see it coming, and in a moment, he could have been gone. No one to fight, laugh, or rule with. I frowned to myself, taking another sip of the brandy before placing it on the counter. It also meant no one to sleep next to, and no one to talk to. I could speak to others. However, I could only talk to Liam. Because somehow he... I didn't know. I could just talk with him, and in a second, stupid fucking Neil almost took him away. Where is the brandy? I jumped at the sound of his voice. The mirror was so foggy I hadn't even noticed when he walked in. Turning to him, my eyes went straight to the bandage that was wrapped over his shoulder and around his waist. When I did glance up, he was looking at me as if I was water and he was a man in the desert. I hadn't realized until then that I was standing completely naked while he stood in pajama pants. Lee. Before I could get the words out, his lips were on mine. My hands went to his hair, kissing him just as hard as he was kissing me. He tasted like honey, and I didn't want to let go of him. But I had to. Breaking away, I took a deep breath, preparing to speak when his lips went to my neck. Liam, we need to— He gripped my nipple, and I felt a moan ripple out of my throat. When his tongue began to trail down from my neck toward my breasts, I began pulling on his hair. Jesus, fuck! Liam, stop! I yelled, and he froze, slowly ripping himself from me to look down at me. In his eyes, I saw confusion, 
frustration, and hurt. Letting me go completely, he took a step back, shaking his head. Sorry. I just came in search of the brandy. He frowned, reaching around me, but I grabbed it first. You shouldn't mix alcohol and painkillers, I said quickly. He glared at me before spotting my hands. I wasn't sure why only then I noticed the dry blood that was still on them. Neil's blood, maybe a little of Declan's as well. Don't ask, Liam. What the fuck happened to your hand? Damn it, just listen to me once. Neil was the one who shot you. I replied, waiting to see how he would react, but he didn't look surprised. That doesn't explain your hand. I said your idiot brother shot you and all you care about is my hand? He should be out there kicking his brother's ass. Yes, because you're my wife. He sighed. I will deal with Neil when I'm not on drugs. Turning away from him, I took off my ring to wash my hands. I handled it. You killed Neil. He whispered, stepping up right behind me. Warmth radiated off him like waves. I felt myself leaning into him, closing my eyes and relaxing as I rested my head on his chest. That is, until I remembered he had a bullet wound and stood straighter. No, I didn't. I should have. I tasered him after beating into his face and stabbing Declan. I prepared myself for his bitching, but when I turned to him, he was smiling. He must have been on some really good drugs. Let me get this straight. You stabbed Declan and attacked and tasered Neil while I was out. He asked, and I nodded. He was going to find out anyway. You show affection in the oddest ways. He said, kissing my forehead and grabbing the brandy. But once again, I took it from him, placing it on the counter again. Not with pills. You've got to be kidding me. Give me the bottle, Melody. He groaned, reaching for it. But I poked his wound, causing him to hiss and flinch back. No means no, Liam. This is the worst thing you've ever done to me. He frowned like a six-year-old boy. I shot you, stabbed your brother, tasered your cousin, and almost cracked open your ex-girlfriend's skull. My ex-girlfriend? Shit, I didn't mean to say that. I bit my lip. Natasha and I met in the bathroom at church. She said some things and I put her head through the glass. So no, withholding brandy isn't the worst thing I've ever done to you. Once again, his lips found mine, but only for a second before he broke away. In my eyes, it is. He whispered. I have two pleasures in this world. One is you, Melody Callahan, and the second, Brandy. Withholding them both is just plain cruel and borderline inhumane. And just like that, something clicked in my mind. Here I was standing naked in front of him, not only in body, but with my sins as well. And he didn't care. He saw the deepest and dirtiest parts of my soul and mind, but didn't care. In fact, he wanted to stay in the darkness with me. Just him, me, and the fucking brandy. They're both just temporary holds. You can have them when you're feeling better. I whispered back, kissing his lips softly before pulling away. His eyes widened as my words set in. Grabbing hold of my waist, he pulled me closer to him. Bringing his lips to my ear, his hard on pressed against my stomach. I won't feel better if I don't have you now, he replied, biting my neck and making me want him even more. I moaned, rubbing against him. Liam, you're hurt. Pulling me away from the sink, he pushed me against the bathroom door. Mel, I plan on fucking your brains out. He pulled a drawstring on his pants. His dick was pointed right at me and I closed my legs while trying to think clearly. You want me to fuck you against this door. I want to hear you scream my name. He rubbed against me as he spoke. You want me inside of you, I can feel it. He whispered, licking up my neck while using his good arm to grab my ass. You're going to be so sore in the morning. I choked out as he sucked away. The warmth of the steam along with his body made me feel like I was on fire. I couldn't even think. All I could do was feel him, and he felt amazing. If I do my job, you will be too. He smirked. So just stop fighting this once and let me have you, wife. I couldn't speak because he didn't wait for a reply. Instead, he plunged so deeply into me that my head went back. Moaning, I grabbed his neck, wrapping my legs around his waist as he held me against the door, going deeper and deeper with each thrust. I'll take that as a yes. He moaned, pulling out once more, only to slam back within me. I've wanted to fuck you against a door for a long time. 
he smiled at me while he rammed into me over and over again i couldn't even make a sentence i couldn't speak i could barely see because my eyes rolled back i wanted it to be hard he added pulling my hands from his neck and holding them above my head i wanted it to be rough he said and it was like he let the animal out of the cage as he thrust into my body repeatedly giving me no time to think or even move all i could do was accept and moan like a bitch his bitch he let go of my hands to grab my waist and i let out a scream of pure pleasure as i came against the force of his cock he didn't let up fucking me harder and harder until he thrust so deeply my voice cracked as he came when he let go of me i felt my legs release him but i was too weak to stand and slid to the floor i took in the warm air greedily but when i looked up all i saw was his erection how is that humanly possible i thought as i stared at him in shock he had stamina like i had never seen looking down at me he stroked himself which in return only made me want him again liam sitting up i grabbed the bottle of pain meds taken two with a glass of water and not brandy like i should have mel could have her way for now looking down at the sleeping beauty beside me i waited for the guilt to kick in however it was nowhere to be found i had tricked her and i didn't fucking regret it because now i had what i wanted i had her i felt it the shift in her as we had our way with one another we went from the bathroom to the shower to the bed where she helped me redress my wound before we fucked again my shoulder like she had said hurt like a bitch but it was worth it because i had her i did what i needed to do to get my wife and there was no fucking taking it back she knew now she knew i was hers and she was mine and now we could move the fuck forward it felt like the longest war but it was over now and we were both victors one day when we were about to die of old age i would tell her but for now i would shut this away and never speak of it again all i had to do was make sure my brother and cousin kept their mouths shut if they didn't i would kill them and i meant it trying my best to ignore the pain i lifted myself from the bed grabbing a pair of jeans and a jacket i had thought i was quiet however mel sat up rubbing her eyes as she tried to focus on me fuck she was beautiful where are you going she yawned and it was cute i'm going to have some words with my brother i grinned walking over to her side i kissed her cheek and she accepted it without a glare or a flinch the pain was worth it come back to bed we can kill him when the sun is up she smiled pulling on my jacket and i was tempted but i needed to make sure this didn't blow up in my face i didn't want to lose her i will be right back i kissed her lips i couldn't stop kissing her i'm not gonna kill him my mother is fond of him however i will express how i feel in other ways she rolled her eyes at me before falling back on the bed fine but if you change your mind cascadia is the best place to hide a body so much forest and so few witnesses god i loved her i'll keep that in mind i laughed walking out the door the moment i did i was hit with fresh air i had to give it to her the camp location was beautifully hidden in the midst of the forest it was large enough to fit all our men with ten or eleven houses and one dining hall at the far end seeing me eric limped over the poor fuck nail and declan are in the dining hall he stated nodding i went slower so he could walk beside me how's your leg i asked trying my best not to smirk melody and her handiwork doctor says it'll be like this for another four or five months i think your wife hates me sir i couldn't help it i laughed even though the pain ached in my chest don't take it personally she hates everyone equally at least she didn't stab you the men were thinking of starting an injured by b m club he said and i stopped b m what the fuck are they calling my wife bloody melody he answered quickly it fit the moment she found out though they were all going to prove that name right shaking my head at him i continued forward none of you call me anything do you if they did i would kill them myself eric tensed and i didn't even bother pushing when i stepped into the dining hall everyone shut up immediately 
My eyes narrowed in on Declan, who was hunched over a bowl of food and looking a little pale. Next to him was Neil, who appeared to be in much better shape, even with a broken nose, a black eye, a split lip, and what looked to be a chokehold bruise on his neck. They would be fine. Don't you just love my wife? I asked them loudly, causing the men to either laugh or grin like fools. Antonio stood up, with a mug filled with what had to be alcohol. Lunga vita alla regina! Father bio o banrin! My men yelled back in Irish. Long live the Queen, indeed. They had been here, what, two days? Maybe three if I'd slept for as long as I thought. Yet here they were, drinking and laughing at one another. Grinning along with them, I nodded over at Neil and Declan, who were both glaring at me. Rising, they followed as I walked from the dining hall to the shade of the trees. Declan moved slower than usual, as did Neil. So, how are you? I asked them, trying not to laugh. Declan stepped forward, nose flared and eyes wide. He was pissed. You fucking two-bit asshole of a dick! You're fucked in the head! Your wife stabbed me! She fucking stabbed me, Liam! Have you ever been stabbed? This bitch! He pointed to Neil. Was the one who fucking shot you and he only gets tasered? All I did was try to calm her down. What kind of bullshit is that? I laughed. I couldn't help it. Even though it hurt like a son of a bitch, all I could do was laugh. It was so fucking funny. I hadn't ever laughed like this before my Mel came along. Why did you even try in the first place? She shot me in the thigh when she was calm. I'm surprised she didn't do more. Declan shook his head and I could see the rage building in his eyes. I fucking hate you all. With that, he walked away. Slowly, the big baby. Neil stood still, not saying a thing and waiting for me to live up to my side of the deal. Part of me had hoped that he would fail so I could hate him. But it was time to move forward. He did what I asked. Sighing, I reached out for his hand. There will be times where I'm still going to be an asshole to you, I said when he took my hand. However, I promise to move forward, brother. I will not hold the past against you any longer. I will no longer hate you for it. I still dislike your wife, but I don't hate you. Can you just do that? Can you just let go of the hate? Automatically, no. However, you're the reason why my wife and I just had mind-blowing sex last night and will continue to do so. That's enough to make me at least want to have a beer with you. After now, we never speak of this moment again. And let Declan know. I had told him the truth. And he looked. Lighter. Like someone had taken the world off his shoulders for once. Thank you, Liam. Well, the first few beers are on you. That shit hurt. I winced and grabbed my chest before walking away. Walking back to our cabin, I found myself feeling lighter as well. Things in my personal life were finally making sense. All I had to do was kill Vance, Sage, Amory, the police, and then take over the rest of the country plus Europe. All of which was possible thanks to my wife. Thanks to my Mel. As if she could read my mind, the moment I walked in I found my beautiful wife dressed in my shirt, sitting on our bed, with files and a laptop around her. The life of a mafia couple. I smirked, taking off my jacket slowly while trying not to wince at the pain. It's a bloody but necessary one, she said, handing me a file as I lay back down. They are calling you Bloody Melody now. I grinned at her flipping through what looked to be more coded letters from Sage. She stopped and frowned. That doesn't strike enough fear into the hearts of men and women everywhere. Oh, it does. They fear and respect you. Maybe more than me. I pouted, and she smiled, bending down to kiss my lips. You could blow up the police commissioner's house for trying to break into our downtown factory. She smiled, causing me to rise up quickly. Maybe a little bit too quickly but I ignored the pain. What the fuck? I shouted, searching for the file she was talking about, but she simply handed me the laptop. That is our meth lab in Orland Park, isn't it? She asked, even though we both knew it was. How the fuck did he get in there? I snapped, watching as the idiot and his men broke into the factory. So much for personal rights. Mel picked up Sage's coded letters. Apparently Vance is tipping them off as a way to keep us distracted. Taking the letters, I raked through them quickly. This could be a trap. 
Sage could be writing these as bullets for us to pick up and shoot ourselves with. I didn't know this Sage well enough yet, but from what I did know she was a snake in the grass and someone needed to cut off her head before she fed and grew. I thought the same thing and had Fidel contact Ryan after we first got off the jet. Apparently, Sage forgets things constantly and needs to write everything down. Amory has her computer coded weekly so no one can hack in. Ryan is a big help with that. But I'm not ruling anything out yet. Right now, we do still have a police rat outside our door. She replied, looking at the computer screen. Declan put a bomb under his house, I said, reminding myself. Mel flipped the channel to the small and modest family home in the Chicago suburbs. He must have kept it even after he lost his family. It was kind of sad. She handed me a cell phone and I couldn't help but smile. Pressing sand and watching the house go up in flames was like watching fireworks during New Year's Eve. No, it wasn't so sad anymore. Flipping back to the factory, I dialed the site number and pressed send once more for the heck of it, and Mel turned to me wide-eyed. What the fuck did you just do? She gasped, staring at the screen. How many people know about the place? We were having meth heads show up at the door. I had everything moved from there a month ago. The commissioner would have found nothing anyway. Mel smiled, but in a flash it was gone as we spotted the commissioner's stupid Smokey the Bear sidekick helping his boss out. Some rats just don't know when to die. Kissing her neck, I pulled her toward me. In due time, love, in due time, we will make them all suffer. And then we kill them. I grinned. Then we kill them, one by one, until all that's left are bloodstains. As she relaxed into me, we watched the police officers who weren't so lucky get burned alive. I counted six running around like chickens with their heads cut off. However, I wasn't sure if there were any still inside the burning building. He's going to try and pin this on us. Mel smirked, drinking my brandy. I hope he does. Now I have a reason to go annoy Judge Randall. What's the point of having a judge on payroll if you never get to use him? And Senator Coleman, she added and looked to me. You know, I've never killed someone in pajamas before. Neither have I. May we always remember our first, I replied, taking her lips with mine. This was how it should have been from the start. She and I setting the world on fire together. Twenty-one. It is not easy to find happiness in ourselves, and it is not possible to find it elsewhere. Agnes Replier Coraline Day Three I can't do this! I choked out before puking into the bowl once again. Cora, you're doing well, and I'm not going to be the one to tell the boss you gave up after only three days. Adriana said, holding my hair back. Pushing her away, I backed up against the tub. My skin is so beaten up, it changed colors. I can barely stand. I can't do this. I can't. I'm in so much pain all the time, Adriana. Please let me give up. Adriana sighed, kneeling in front of me. She took my hands and pulled me to my feet. You are stronger than you think, Cora. In three days you have come so far. Yes, I know you are in pain, but you aren't the same Cora. So suck it up, get dressed, and go to dinner so we can get to work tonight. She demanded, handing me an outfit to wear. Grabbing the clothes, I glared at her. I hate you. No, you don't. She smirked before leaving. It hurt like a bitch getting into those clothes. My arms felt like they were being burned off. If I hadn't just thrown up everything in my stomach, then I would have just gone to bed. But I was so damn hungry. Washing out my mouth, I rinsed before heading down the stairs. Slowly. Coraline? I jumped at her voice. Not Olivia. Yes, Olivia. I turned to her when we reached the dining hall. She looked me up and down, but didn't say anything. Stepping into the dining room, both Evelyn and Cedric stopped speaking and just stared at me. How did Mel handle all the staring? Whenever people stared at her, she simply walked prouder. Taking a deep breath, I walked slowly to my seat. 
Placing the napkin in my lap, I grabbed some food and pretended they weren't there. Okay, Caroline, enough. What is happening to you? Are you all right? I'm worried, Evelyn asked, causing me to jump. Nothing, I'm fine, I replied, filling my plate. The way you wince when you breathe means you, at the very least, have a bruised rib. Not to mention the busted lip you're hiding under makeup. But those are only the wounds we can see. I'm willing to bet Declan's life on it, so tell me the truth, Caroline. Cedric demanded as he cut into his lamb. I'm taking a self-defense class. I answered, waiting for them to flip out. However, only Olivia seemed shocked. Why in God's name are you taking a self-defense class? It seemed like a stupid question, because I would like to defend myself. This is about Melody, isn't it? She snapped. She is killing this family and tearing us apart from the inside out. It's not like we were perfect before. What would Declan think, Coraline? What if you were to get hurt? You have no idea what you're doing. You aren't some... Shut up! I yelled, standing up angrily. What I want to do with my life and my body is none of your damn business. The only person's opinion that matters is Declan's. We get it. You're bitter that Mel stole your thunder and the magazines no longer give a shit about you. But it doesn't mean you have to take it out on me. Go look up baby names or something and leave me the hell alone. When I was done, I blinked a few times, unsure of where that came from. Taking a seat again, I kept my head down and finished eating. Sorry for cursing Evelyn. Not at all. Seems like you've been holding that in for a while. She laughed when I looked up. Cedric frowned. Who's giving you these lessons? Or are they trustworthy? Adriana? Mel's? The slave girl who follows Melody around like a lost dog? Olivia snorted, drinking her wine. Olivia, that's enough! Cedric snapped, and she stood up straight immediately. Caroline, when do you train again? Tomorrow at five, I answered, smiling at Olivia. Very well. I shall see you both, then. Shit. Day five. Do it, I told Adriana as I sat in front of the mirror. Are you sure, Cara? Evelyn asked, looking at my hair. It's just hair. It'll grow back, right? Adriana almost ripped my ponytail out during our fight yesterday, I said. After everything, Evelyn and Cedric were both watching as if it was some damn sport. Cedric didn't really speak. However, he would frown every time my body collided with the floor. Adriana demanded I learn how to use my size to an advantage, so everything I learned had been quick jabs and kicks. She made me jump up and down for an hour straight before having me kick her hands. But I could barely even stand up, let alone kick. When I puked, she gave me water, some bread, and a six-minute break before putting me to work again. Here I go, Adriana said, and I closed my eyes. All I heard were the scissors snipping away at my hair. A few minutes later, I joked, Evelyn, your nephew will still love me if I'm bald, right? Um, Evelyn. My eyes flew open and I stared at my reflection. I looked so different. Not bad different. Just different. Evelyn gasped. Adriana, you must cut my hair from now on. She messed with some of the edges of my hair until she met my eyes in the mirror. You look beautiful. And Declan, who is like my son, will fall in love with you all over again. God, I hope so. Now you, Adriana. I smiled, standing up as I pulled her down. Cor, nope, we are doing this, and if you don't, I will cut your hair while you sleep. I threatened, causing her to roll her eyes. I don't sleep. She joked. Why doesn't that shock me? I smiled, grabbing the flat iron. I think we may have some contacts. Let me see if there are any for your prescription. Evelyn said quickly, walking out of the room. Sexy Adriana is under here somewhere. I grinned. This is going to be like one of those teen movies. Day 7 I pressed my dress down for what had to be the ninth time since we stepped out of the car. I felt like I was going to jump out of my skin. I was so excited to see him. However, the first person to step out of the jet was one of the men I didn't recognize, followed by Mel. She looked me over as she made her way towards me. However, I couldn't pay attention because there was my Declan. His eyebrows squished together as he looked at my hair. 
Do you like it? I asked him as I brushed the back down a little. He reached over and played with it a little before looking back to me. I'm kind of shocked, but you look cute. Cute. Not beautiful. But I would take that for now. It was better than nothing. Twenty-two. It is surely easier to confess a murder over a cup of coffee than in front of a jury. Frederick Duran, Matt. Liam. That's right, you little shit. Come closer. She said as she eyed the deer standing a few dozen feet away. Relax your arm and breathe. I told her, resting my head right beside hers. My arm is relaxed and you're doing enough breathing for the both of us. She replied like the smart ass she was. Backing away from her, I rolled my eyes. Well then, go ahead. Kill Bambi. She released the arrow, and just like I figured, it went right past the deer's head, causing it to run away in fear. She watched it disappear into the forest in silent rage before turning back to me. Handing me the bow and arrow, she pulled out a gun and I tried not to laugh. I could kill it so much better with this. She yelled, and it was cute especially since I knew I wasn't the source of her rage. That's not the point. I lifted the bow to the sky, pulling it back and releasing the arrow. It went straight through a bird's heart. Mel simply rolled her eyes, pointing to the sky, and shot three times. Three birds for me, one for you. What's the point again? She smiled, looking down at the... Fuck. We just killed mockingbirds. I frowned, kneeling down to stare at the four birds now half-blown to pieces on the ground. Please tell me you're joking. Smiling at her once more, I stood and released another arrow into the tree, watching another one of the beautiful birds fall to its death. Show off. I found the one weapon my wife can't use. I grinned as she glared at me. I think I'll show it off as much as possible. I'm a people hunter. Who hunts people with arrows? She snapped, and I opened my mouth to speak, but she glared. If you say Green Arrow, I will shoot you in the other thigh. She added, and all I could do was smirk at her. All people are animals, love. They freeze when they are afraid. They cry out in pain as they die. A hunter is a hunter. And if you can kill a deer, you can kill a person. It's that simple, I replied. Plus, I wasn't going to say the Green Arrow. Maybe Hawkeye or Katniss Everdeen, but definitely not the Green Arrow. Her eyes became wide and she turned back from me, heading back to camp. It wasn't hard catching up to her. You are such a child, she said, but I could see the smallest grin on her lips. Yeah, yeah, I said, taking her hand and pulling her to me. She looked at her hands and then to me. I knew she was somewhat uncomfortable, but she didn't pull away. What? Aren't you going to ask me to go steady first? Maybe if we were in the 1950s. Have you ever been on a date? I asked her, causing us to stop. I don't date. And you better not try any of that romantic shit on me either. She said. Girls like romantic shit. I smiled. She always made me smile. And I wasn't sure if I could bring myself to hide it from her or the world. I'm not girls. I'm Melody. We can compromise. I said, leaning against one of the trees. She crossed her arms and stood straighter. Or I could shoot you. Violence is not the answer, love. Well, violence against me isn't the answer. I replied, thinking quickly. We can have private dates. You and I, in our bedroom, where only I can see you being kind. Before she could speak, I pulled her towards me and pressed her up against the tree, kissing her ruthlessly only to break away. On special occasions, we can kill the cops or anyone else who gets in our way in our pajamas again. We can watch as they bleed out and burn, drink wine and have each other over and over again. After all, we are both people hunters. I whispered into the distance between our lips. She kissed me, pressing her whole body against mine and broke away with a grin. You sure know how to charm a woman. Her words made me so hard that I lifted her up and pinned her against the bark. God, I loved my wife. Sir! Ma'am! A voice called out behind us, and right then and there I wanted to snap his neck. The darkness in Mel's eyes told me that she wanted him dead as well. 
Breaking away from me, she turned to Fidel, who stood with his back turned. What? He didn't turn around. The jet has been fueled and will be ready to depart. Neither of your phones were working, but your father, sir, has tried to reach you. The police commissioner is giving a statement to the press about the fire in an hour. They also came by the house this morning. That bitch came to my motherfucking house again. He was just asking to fucking die. Are the men ready? Mel asked, adjusting her clothing, but she didn't need to. She always looked the same. Dutiful, deadly, and fuckable. Yes, ma'am. Monty and all the others who drove left last night. He answered quickly. He was definitely more afraid of Mel than he was of me. I was going to have to balance that scale as well. Leave us, I demanded, and he was gone. Turning to my wife, I tried to breathe calmly. However, I wanted the cop fucker dead. I'm going to kill him, I told her. I'll find out. It won't work. You have to break him. She sighed, stepping in front of me. Killing him is only half the battle. He's becoming a model for the rest of the force. He is becoming a hero. He is going to give some uplifting speech and try to reinstate a hope for better. It's time we do what we promised to do if he didn't back down. We make Chicago bleed, I said, and she nodded. When the crime is in the ghettos, no one gives a shit. When the crime makes its way to the suburbs, people demand better from their police officers. They began to distrust them. When they do, we will step forward and remind them why they love the Callahans. I will have Declan and Monty hack the records and find all the police officers who have families. She smiled, but it wasn't enough. I wanted the city and the state to cry out in agony. Not just the police, I added as we headed back to camp. I want the names of every judge, politician, and businessman who does not support our family. You step in front of us, and we blow a hole through you, and every last person who ever knew you. There would be blood, and lots of it. Melody People of Chicago, I come to you now because I know you are afraid. I'm from Chicago. I know this city like the back of my hand, and I know that we can get back to the glory days. It's why the Chicago PD is working overtime to make our city safe. If you see anything, we will protect you if you come forward. It's time we take our city back from those who believe we have given up, from those who think we are just going to allow them to keep. His voice makes me want to shoot myself. I groaned muting the computer in front of us. Maybe we should kill him now. Do we have snipers in the area? Liam drank my wine as he relaxed as well. You and I both know that would be a bad idea. Tomorrow begins the reign of terror. Just hold off another twelve hours. Sighing, I looked at the computer screen, where the idiot was still speaking. Does he really believe anyone is going to talk? They would have to be pure idiots. Liam said... However, Fidel stood up and placed another file in front of us. What is this? I asked, but the moment I opened it, a grin spread across my face. I handed it to Liam, waiting to see how he would react. Jesus Christ! You did this in church! He laughed, lifting up the hospital photo of Natasha. I should have just killed her. I was told you saw her for breakfast. I stated, and he looked up to me, eyes wide, before turning to Fidel. His jaw set as he threw the photo back on the table. You had me followed, he hissed. The morning you were being an ass? I paused, and grabbing the brandy, added, The morning you were being a giant ass. I had you followed, and your ex-girlfriend... She was a bitch I fucked in the past, not my ex-girlfriend. He snapped. Leaning in, I made sure he could see my eyes. I'm not sorry, not even a little bit, and I don't care who she was. She wanted to be a part of your future, and I made sure she knew what would happen if she crossed that line. His nose flared, but he simply glared at Fidel. Why are you showing this to us? Miss Breyer filed a police report to Sam, claiming, ma'am, that you were the one who attacked her. Brooks is waiting for your directions. Fidel replied, but before I could speak, Liam cut me off. Kill her, he demanded. I warned her when she ambushed me before. That would look bad. I sighed, because I really did want the bitch dead. If she were to be killed, it would be too obvious. She has family, they would realize it, and that is just too many loose ends for one whore. I just wasn't sure what to do with her. 
Liam pinched the bridge of his nose before lifting the photo again. A broken nose and jaw, large abrasions across the forehead with trace amounts of bleach in her lungs. Bleach in her lungs? I shrugged. Must have used bleach in the toilet bowl I stuck her head in. He tried not to smile, but I could see his lips twitch up. Shaking his head, he placed the file back down. Ninety percent of those wounds could have been self-inflicted. After all, she is a very unstable woman with a history of stalking and violent acts in a fit of jealousy. He said seriously, looking over to Declan, who looked much better than he did earlier this week. He was lucky I had only used my small knife. Declan, make sure all records of Natasha Breuer Lister is mentally unbalanced. Padel, have Brooks flag her as mentally ill by whatever doctor she visited. Pay him well enough to make sure he stresses the need to get her help. And by the end of the week, make sure she's in Westridge. Westridge is the worst mental hospital in the state, if not the country. I smiled. If Natasha wasn't crazy now, she would be. I know. We can kill her after the dust settles. He smiled back. How romantic. I hate blondes. I laughed along with him. However, I stopped when I heard a snicker. Poor Olivia. Liam turned to Neil. I didn't bother giving him a glance. I don't give a shit, I replied looking out the window. She should be happy I took it easy on him. Liam shook his head. You broke his nose, something I'm starting to say you're good at, and damn well choked the life out of him, then tasered him. Are you defending him? I did worse to Declan and he didn't even shoot you. He was too calm about this and it pissed me the fuck off. I second that. Declan muttered, just loud enough so that we could hear him. Liam rolled his eyes. We're going to war, remember. After tomorrow, hell is going to break loose. We're a family and we need to make sure our personal shit is together. Besides, you stabbed Declan with a knife the size of a dagger. Are we seriously discussing the type of weapon used to stab me in the chest? Declan asked, and it was my turn to roll my eyes. It wasn't even really your chest. It was much closer to your shoulder blade. The worst you needed were stitches, you big baby. I added, and Neil snickered until I glared at him again. I have a much bigger knife waiting for you. I snapped. If Neil ever shoots anything near me again, I will take off his head and mount it on the fucking wall. He seemed to mean it, but I wasn't sure. I still hate him, I replied, drinking. Looks like I'm not the only romantic one. He grinned. However, it was interrupted by a cell phone. Neil answered it quickly before handing it to Liam. Father. Sighing, Liam placed it on speaker before setting it on the table. To what do I owe the pleasure? Liam asked, sitting up straighter. I didn't understand why men always felt the need to prove something to their fathers. Liam, Melody, I'm sure you both took time out of your busy schedules to watch the news. The police commissioner is becoming a problem. Cedric's voice sounded hard, like he was trying to control his anger. Yes? We are handling it, Cedric. Is that the only reason you called? I asked before Liam could make a fool out of himself. He looked me dead in the eye as if I'd lost my mind. There wasn't a reply at first, just a deep breath. Did I tick off Cedric? Too fucking bad. Evelyn just received an invitation to a wedding being held here in Chicago for a sage Roscoff and Amory Valero. Liam's eyes narrowed as we looked at each other. Nodding, he took a deep breath. We will be attending. If that's all, Father, we must get going. Liam replied, ending the call before he could get another word in. Rising from our seats, we both walked into our private cabin at the back of the jet. The second the door closed, I began to speak. You are the head of this family, not your fucking father. You do not sit up straighter for him. You do not even give him all your fucking attention. And you sure as hell do not answer his questions like you're still second in command. The only person who gets that amount of respect is me. You are a leader, so lead. You share with him when you motherfucking feel like it, not when he calls and barks. You may be his son, but you are not his child. You are Kena Kanarta. I am the boss, even to our fathers. If you embarrass me or yourself like that again, I will rip out your throat. Liam. She's right. That was the very first thing that went through my mind after she left. I was the Kena Kanarta, not my father. I had seen him as such for so long that it was almost second nature to show him that same respect. Stepping off the plane, Mel stood before none other than Caroline. What in Jesus fuck happened to my wife? Declan asked from behind me. What happened to her hair? 
Neil asked, staring at the short-haired girl standing in front of Mel. Without answering either of them, I walked to my wife, only to be met with another shock. Is that the ugly duckling? Adriana stood beside Caroline, her nest of hair tamed, her glasses gone and her face covered in light makeup. She wasn't drop-dead gorgeous, but she didn't deserve the ugly duckling title any more. Adriana, ride with us, was all Mel said when I reached her. Cora, we will talk later. Once we reached the car, the driver opened the door for us while Adriana took a seat up front. I'm guessing you had something to do with this. I asked Mel once we were on our way home. She came to me. I had Adriana do what she could. She replied, not in the least bit worried about how this might turn out. Declan. Well, Declan really couldn't do shit, and that's probably why she wasn't bothered. Sighing, I turned to the woman up front. Well, what can my sister-in-law do? She was difficult on the first day, frustrated with herself and the world on the second. The third day she puked up half her weight, and then the rest of the week she got a lot of the basics down. She will need more practice, but she is getting used to carrying a knife. Mrs. Callahan was right about the gun. She tried it and almost blew her hand off. I could hear the amusement in her voice. However, in my mind, I couldn't picture Caroline doing any of those things. And her hair? Mel asked. She got a little carried away with the whole becoming a warrior thing. She demanded to listen to Rocky during one of the morning sessions. Then that night she wanted to listen to Eye of the Tiger on repeat. Ev Mrs. Callahan found it fitting. Mel sat up. I thought I told you to keep this discreet. I tried, ma'am. The second and third days were the hardest for Coraline, and she was so sore she couldn't hide it during dinner. Mr. and Mrs. Callahan believe it is just self-defense. Olivia Callahan tried to tell Neil, so I had her phone jammed, ma'am. Mel frowned, but nodded, even though no one else would be able to see her but me. I see. I frowned as well. Family dinner tonight was going to be interesting. It's nothing to worry about. We have much bigger things on our plate, like Sage and Amory. Mel said, hissing out their names as if they were poison. Which is why, I think, we should plan a small trip to Italy. Liam, we cannot take Vance's cars out now. It is probably at the bottom of our to-do list. She wasn't getting it, though. We don't have to go. Our men could go. After all, what better time to destroy cars and maybe a home or two while everyone is celebrating a wedding? They would be blindsided. She smirked. Guerrilla warfare. Exactly. Adriana, when is the wedding? Three weeks from today, ma'am. She replied quickly, handing us a wedding invitation. Mel stared at it with just as much disgust as I did. Allowing it to drop to the floor, she turned back to me. Are you sure you don't mind not being able to physically destroy Vance's things? It was the only downside. Yes, but seeing Vance's face during the wedding when he gets that call will surely make up for it. He wouldn't even be able to publicly display his anger. Instead, he would have to take it up the ass and just smile at me. She shook her head at me and stared out at the city. I watched her eyes storm over and I wished more than anything I could read her mind. She turned to me with a smirk that I wanted to kiss off her fucking face. My father told me once that the world wanted Kate Middleton or the First Lady. Someone to kiss babies and write big checks on your behalf. She said it slowly, but I still didn't understand. You want to write a check? Why would that get her so excited? Yes. She smirked, looking back outside. To the men and women of the Chicago PD who were injured during those terrible fires. After all, how can they afford all those bills? I even think we should do it in person. I bet our favorite superintendent and commissioner, Officer Patterson, will be there as well to console the families. Dear God, I loved my wife. Take us to St. John's Medical Hospital. I smiled alongside her, reaching into my jacket for my checkbook. Should I make it rich or obnoxiously rich? I asked, wondering how many zeros to put in the space. Obnoxiously rich, of course. Something only a Callahan can do. She grinned, looking toward Adriana. Adriana, how fast can you leak this to the press? Ten minutes. If you would like to change, I brought clothing. It's in the back. She answered, already dialing. She had standby clothes. Mel nodded, taking off her seatbelt as she climbed into the trunk of the car. Seriously, how unfirst ladylike. I grinned, looking back at her. 
Shut the fuck up, you Irish asshole, and keep your eyes forward. Why, I've seen it all before. She smirked. Wouldn't want our driver peeking, would we? My eyes narrowed at the man behind the steering wheel. At her words, he visibly tensed. She knew I would watch him like a hawk, which would stop me from staring at her. I would have to make her pay later on tonight. Melody The Chicago Police Department is important to the well-being of this city. My husband and I do not want our men and women in uniform to worry about their medical bills or their livelihoods after protecting us. It is my great honor to present this check for $19 million to our Commissioner and Superintendent, Officer Patterson. I smiled into the cameras that stood in the ER wing of St. John's Hospital. Officer Patterson glared at me with a mixture of hate, anger, and disgust. But he took the money anyway. Thank you so much, Mrs. Callahan, he said, practically sneering through his teeth. I'm sure this will help the families who lost loved ones and those injured. Overwhelmingly so. Liam smirked behind me. It was such a tragedy. Those old factories should be checked. Aren't they also known for crime? Are the police looking into this? Commissioner Patterson opened his mouth, but the reporters heard Liam's questions and jumped on him. Commissioner Patterson, is this going to be one of the things you plan on fixing in Chicago? Commissioner, is there going to be an investigation? Is it true your house was also destroyed? Rumor has it that it was a terrorist attack. Did this have anything to do with your investigation of Flight 735? That caught my attention, and Liam's too, apparently, because his jaw tightened. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a hospital, and we do not want to bother any of the patients that are here in need of medical attention. Commissioner Patterson told them all as politely as he could. A doctor stepped forward as the reporters fanned out. She looked almost starstruck as she stared into Liam's eyes. Could she still be a doctor if I cut off her hands? Mr. Callahan, I'm Dr. Amy Lewis. Thank you so much for the donation. Your family has been so kind to the patients of this hospital, as well as the staff. It would be our honor to show you around. I'm sure the victims of the accident would love to meet you. She gushed while I tried not to vomit in my mouth. I don't believe that would be a good idea. Commissioner Patterson stated, causing the whole staff to look at him like he was crazy. Most likely because he was. It's been an exciting couple of days. They may need their rest. I assure you it will be fine, Dr. Lewis replied, but only because she wanted to spend more time with my husband. Stepping in front of Liam, I smiled like I was in a fucking Crest commercial. Of course, I would love to meet them. Sweetheart, do you have time? Liam raised an eyebrow at me. Anything you wish, love. Dr. Amy Lewis looked like she came in her scrubs at the sound of his voice. I wonder if I can smash her head in. Where are we going first? She seemed startled by my voice, as if she had forgotten I was still here. I felt my hand slide to the back of my pants toward my knife when Liam grabbed me, pulling me into his arms. Control yourself, love. He hissed into my ear. Taking a deep breath, we followed the stupid bitch as she led us towards another part of the hospital. This is our burn unit, where many of the officers are being treated. She replied, moving down the hall as if she were putting the men on display. I wasn't sure what it was that made me stop in front of one of the officers' rooms. Maybe it was all the flowers, cards, and balloons. Or maybe it was the small girl who sat in her mother's lap laughing with her burned father that did it. The side of his face was wrapped in bandages along with both arms, but he was still alert. Stepping in, the family froze and looked at us. Officer Pope, this is Mr. and Mrs. Callahan. As of a few moments ago, they have paid off all your bills. Dr. Amy What's-Her-Face said joyfully. The woman in the chair broke out into sobs before running up and giving me a hug. I was not a hugger. However, I couldn't be myself. Thank you so very much. You have no idea how much this means to my family. She cried, stepping back to adjust herself and pick up her daughter. Anything to help. I can't imagine the life you live. I said softly, always worrying if your husband could be wounded or even worse. It's the least we can do. Thank you. Really. Thank you. She wiped her face, turning to her daughter. Tell Mrs. Callahan thank you, sweetheart. The small girl hid behind her. Thanks. Let's go tell Grandpa the good news, she replied, looking back to her husband for a moment, who nodded slowly. 
There's that first lady, Liam whispered, kissing the back of my head. Mr. and Mrs. Callahan? Dr. Amy, the whore, called out. Liam, I will stay. I told him. He gave me an odd look before exiting with the rest of them. Walking over to a coffee pot, I grabbed a cup before taking a seat. Officer Pope simply glared at me, and I knew he had an idea of who we really were underneath the public mask. I have no idea why people choose to become police officers. I frowned, looking over his burnt skin. Half of his face was basically melted off. Someone has to put people like you away, he struggled to say. Raising an eyebrow, I smiled. That's never going to happen, and if it were, it wouldn't be you. I've seen better-looking beef jerky. I could have a wire, he hissed out, and I rolled my eyes while reaching over to push on his wrapped skin. He cried out softly. You don't have a wire, and even if you did, I have a frequency jammer. If that didn't work, then I would kidnap your family until you confessed to tampering with evidence to falsely arrest me. I wasn't an idiot, and after all, we were in a hospital full of cops. His eyes narrowed. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Don't you have guilt? Or are you all just heartless, cold-blooded snakes? Your drugs killed dozens of people in this city alone. Just in one week. God knows how many people die in this country just so you can make a buck. Y'all are sick. How the hell do you sleep at night? Who did you lose? I asked him, taking a sip of coffee. His words didn't bother me. You don't give a damn. Nope, not at all. I smiled. You see, you're blaming me for something that isn't my fault. Do you blame a bartender for giving someone a drink? No, because he's supplying a demand. No one is forcing anyone to do or take anything. Whoever died, it was on them and their family. They should have gotten their shit together. Their family could have stood by them. Instead, you looked for someone to blame. You must be fucked up in the head to think like that. There ain't any justification for what you people do. He snapped, looking away. You insult us more by pretending you're good Catholic folk. You don't care about God. I don't think you even believe in him. I do. I care about God, and I do believe in him. I really did. However, I know why I was created. God needs me. What would happen if there weren't people like me? If the world were perfect, if everything was the way you wished it to be, then why would you pray? God needs me, because without us, you forget about him. He's on my side, not yours. We will see about that. The commissioner has his eye on you all. He won't rest until you're all in jail. Then I'll rip out his eyes and put him six feet under. You should thank God you're in here, because after tomorrow, Chicago will never be the same. You can tell the commissioner I said that. I replied, leaving the coffee cup with my lipstick imprint on the counter before turning to leave. By the way, I slept perfectly fine last night. It's all about the thread count. I smiled at him once before leaving. Chicago would burn, and they would know it was their fault. Once the smoke cleared and the dust settled, we would rebuild. We would own this motherfucking city. Stepping into the corner, I placed a call. Put Officer Pope and his family on the list. Yes, ma'am. Twenty-three. Courage is the power to let go of the familiar. Raymond Lindquist. Cedric. I believe your son and his wife just dismissed me. My nose flared as I clutched onto the phone in my hands. Why is it whenever they do something wrong they magically become mine? My wife asked as she dressed. Because... Choose your words carefully, dear. Walking up behind her, I grabbed her waist, pulling her to me. I ruled once. I was king. And yet my own children are dismissing me as if I were a butler. When did I fall so far? She laughed, turning back to me. My dear, you were king. And when you were, no one could speak a word to you. Your word was law and those around you listened. Neither your sons nor I could talk you out of anything you wished. But you gave up your crown because it no longer fit. In doing so, you agreed to allow Liam and Mel to rule how they wished. They may bloody well destroy this family. I pouted as she kissed me. Then let them. We have more than enough independently to leave and never be found if we wish. However, you and I both know they aren't destroying this family. She was right, but I didn't like it. I just wish they would. No, 
You promised me you would only get involved if they asked. They haven't, so stay the fuck out of it. You have done your part, I just want my husband. Staring into her eyes, I nodded before grabbing hold of her shirt and ripping it from her body. Buttons popped off her like bullets. Then have him, because he definitely wants you. I whispered before ripping her bra off her as well. Her breast jiggled free, and I smirked to myself before taking him in my mouth. She moaned my name, and suddenly the last thing on my mind was children. Or their chaos. Twenty-four. We don't murder, we kill. You don't murder animals, you kill them. Samuel Fuller Melody Flipping on the television, I couldn't help but smile. Three weeks ago, Commissioner Patterson, you stood before us all and promised to make this city safe. You promised that you would put an end to the blood and corruption, but instead all you've done is made it worse. For three weeks it has been raining blood. The death count is up to 27 that we know of. Most of them innocent people who just want to live their lives in peace. People are dying left and right. You did this. A man yelled out in the crowd. My son was walking home from school. He walked that same path every day and then... A mother sobbed with a photo of her son in her hands. Twenty-seven in the suburbs, fifty-four in the city, two a day in the most poverty-stricken parts of the city. Commissioner Patterson, is this the new normal? A reporter asked. Commissioner Patterson looked old, tired, and stressed as he tried to find the words. The Chicago Police Department is... The Chicago Police Department is no safer than we are. How many men and women have we lost in the last three weeks? We have lost a total of 19 men in the line of duty. Commissioner Patterson sighed. I could feel the defeat coming through the screen. How can you keep us safe if you can't even keep your own people safe? Is the FBI going to get involved? Nope. I said aloud, and even if they did, I had more than a few friends I could call on. Each of these instances has been at the hands of multiple criminals, leaving them up to the Chicago Police Department to solve. However, they will be consulting on many of the cases involved. The commissioner stood firm. Will the governor call for a state emergency? Not if he wants to lose his next election. I'm sure he was a friend of the family's. Carline held a function for him. We are not at that point yet. I understand how frightened you all are, but please don't lose hope in us. It's what the people who are responsible for all this want. Do you know who is responsible? Some have speculated that this is because of the Irish mob. Others say there was a breakout at the county jail. I wanted to listen to his reply. However, I was distracted by the man kissing my neck from behind. Leaning into him, I allowed myself to relax. Cape and annoy on our city, he whispered when he came up for air. Wrapping his arms around me, he pulled me in closer. The commissioner seems stressed. I smirked, reaching up to run my hand through his hair. With all the murders, robberies, and bad press, I would be stressed as well, he snickered. Turning me to him, his eyes went straight to my breasts, but that's what I got for standing in my underwear as I watched the news. Like what you see? I whispered to him while pulling on his tie. His eyes were coated with lust before he shook his head clear. Yes, very much so. And as much as I would enjoy making you scream my name until your voice cracked, we have a very important wedding to go to. You're turning down sex for a wedding. It's not just any wedding, love. He pouted. It's Sage and Amory's wedding, which means... Which means you get to sit and eat their food and drink wine while our men fuck them across the ocean. And I don't want to be late for a moment of it. Stepping closer to him, I retied the bow tie around his neck. Of course not. Who would like to have sex when they could watch Vance lose control? Who knows when that could happen again? You won't be having sex with anyone for a while either, but still. I kissed him deeply, biting onto his lip before breaking away. His mouth dropped open as my words sunk in. Sweetheart, this body is now closed to you, husband. Stepping away from him, I turned to walk to my closet, but he pulled me back. Let's not do anything rash. He replied, lifting me up and throwing me onto the bed, crawling on top of me as he brushed my hair back. We don't have time. I smiled as he kissed me. We're the guests of honor. We can make time. He whispered, kissing from my lips to my cheek and then to my neck. 
Pushing up against him, I was able to flip him onto his back. Sitting on his waist, I stared into his eyes. You made your choice, husband. Now deal with it. I smirked as I ground my hips into him before rising, and, sure enough, his hard-on was clear to the world. Wife. Husband. I smiled, and the moment I took off towards my closet, he leapt off the bed after me. Sadly, he was too slow, and I was able to lock myself in my closet. Damn it! He pounded on the door as I laughed. Calm the fuck down and finish getting dressed. I called out as I looked for the shoes I wanted to wear. Take off your underwear. You won't be needing them tonight. The fuck I will. You aren't getting shit from me. I replied, even though I couldn't stop grinning. Fine, then. I'll rip the bloody things off you. His voice was fading, and I rolled my eyes at him. Hearing the door close, I smiled to myself. In the last three weeks, my relationship with Liam had changed drastically. We no longer fought with each other about personal matters. Instead, most of our issues were with the job, and even those were few and far between. Sometimes our plan of attack didn't mesh well, and the only way we could settle it was to fuck it out. Neither of us complained about that, though. In fact, I was sure he disagreed with me sometimes just so we could have sex afterward, the little prick. Yet I found myself smiling more often because of him. I was happy, and that just seemed odd to me. He insisted we have our dates at least once a week. The first week was awkward, because I hated the word date, and neither of us did anything, really, except work. The second week he brought me a snitch, a lower-level pawn who had been in the process of speaking with the police to get out of jail time. Too bad for him, we wiretapped all our men's phones. To make an example of him, I gave him embalming fluid to drink, and when he died, we made sure to ship his tongue to the commissioner. After that, Liam and I didn't come out of our room for two days. The date we had this week consisted of Liam and I both naked on our bed watching the local news. We had scheduled a hit on three officers and their families. Ma'am, it's Adriana. I have your dress. Adriana knocked. Opening the door, I pulled the dress from the bag. Perfect. I smiled, touching the satin of the dress. Liam. Stepping out of our bedroom, I tried to wipe the grin off my face. However, it was damn near impossible. I hadn't known before that I would have no other choice than to say I was in love with Melody Nietzsche Callahan. I loved how she broke people's noses, how she smiled whenever we killed someone. I loved the way she moaned my name when we made love, only to slap me afterward. She was ruthless in everything she did and yet she could still manage to be open with me. We had both changed. I felt like I had known her for a lifetime, and not just a few weeks. So, I'm guessing by your smile that Al is well in your bloody wonderland, Cedric asked me as I reached the study. He was decked to the nines like myself, and seemed just as excited as I was, despite the fact that he didn't know any of our plans. Yes, father, I said, stepping into the study. All is well in our bloody wonderland. In fact, the adventure is just beginning. He sighed, taking a seat in front of the desk. Must you torture me, boy, or will you tell me what's going on? Half the city is covered in blood and the other half is afraid of its shadow. Both you and Melody insisted that we attend this mockery of a wedding. However, neither Neil nor Declan are going to be in attendance. You always said I was impatient. If so, I see where I get it from. I replied, pouring myself a glass of wine. I'm guessing you and Melody are no longer shooting at each other. For now, my wife's opinion of me changes more often than the tide. She may shoot me tomorrow if I tell her I dislike her gun collection. But, at this moment, are you asking as my father or as a cane of canarsa? I cut him off leaning into my chair, because it was my chair and not his. Kicking my feet onto the desk, I watched as his eyes narrowed at my shoes. He used to hate it when I placed my feet on his desk as a teen, but he couldn't say anything now. I'm asking as a father. Son, are you happy with your wife? Yes, father. Everything is bloody and well in fucking Wonderland. I drank some more. She is... She's bloody melody and perfect. God created her and then shattered the mold afterwards because the world could not handle two of her. Look who's become a poet. Hardly. It's a simple fact. My wife was a ruthless animal, 
and it only made her sexier. So then I could expect something to go terribly wrong at this when. He really wanted to know. It was almost sad. I hope when I have a child I'm not in the predicament you're in. I laughed at him. Knowing you, I doubt she'll allow your son or daughter to take the throne as easily as I did. He was joking. He had to be joking. Bullshit! The amount of hell you put me through. I put you through hell so you could sit in that seat and call hell to you. In three weeks you've brought the city to its knees. He almost sounded jealous, but I also could hear the pride. We, Melody and I, brought it to its knees. However, it's not bowing yet. The police commissioner is still holding out for hope to overcome the mess. A judge gave him the okay to place wiretaps on the house and our phones. I snickered. That was only after the first week. When was this? It doesn't matter. I grinned, drinking again. We had jammers and frequency scramblers placed throughout the house and then updated all the phones. Melody insisted that we make an example out of the judge. I waited for it to click in. After all, it had been all over the news that week. He shook his head as the realisation hit him. Judge Randall, they found him hanging from the bridge. I figured, but I didn't understand why. I don't believe the commissioner has had any help with the cart since then. Because they were fucking smart. And you both don't want to end him. Oh, how the tide had turned. And let another wannabe hero take his place. He's about to break, and when he does, his moral compass will either force him to take his life, or he will just drink himself to death. Either way, I don't give two flying fucks. He picked a fight, and now he was going to lose. Bloody Wonderland, he said again with a smile. Before I could reply, there was a knock at the door. Enter, I called out, and in walked my mother dressed in a beautiful long-sleeved green dress. You look beautiful, mother, I said, standing up to greet her. She kissed my cheek. Thank you, son. I came to tell you that there are two officers at our door. They're asking to speak with you. I thought I would let you know personally. This is the third time, Liam. I'm not pleased. Rule 16. Never displease your mother. Call my wife. No need. Melody stepped inside, making me want to drop to my knees and kiss her feet. She was an absolute vision in the long, strapless, white dress she wore. She looked like a goddess or an angel, and I felt lucky just to stand before her. Father, mother, thank you. However, my wife and I have some business to attend to. We shall meet you at the wedding. Please send the officers in. My Mel replied as she walked, more like glided, towards me. Taking her hand, I kissed it once my parents were gone. You look beyond beautiful. Save your flattery and tell me where we are going to kill these sons of bitches for returning here. She glared as she fixed my hair. There was another knock at the door and I smirked at her. Let's find out. I grinned, walking to my desk. Enter. Sadly, it wasn't the commissioner but his Smokey the Bear sidekick along with another broad-shouldered man with orange hair. No commissioner. I'm insulted. I turned to Mel, who only glared at them. The city is a bit too chaotic for him to make it, Smokey said. As you know, I... We don't care. What do you want? Mel asked, looking at the younger man next to Smokey. We're here to wave the white flag, the orange-haired man declared. I felt my brow rise and a smirk curl my lip. When I looked over to Mel, she frowned. Of course she would. White flags weren't her forte. Stepping towards the man, I looked him over. You're Irish? Yes, Mr. Callahan. Who the fuck forgot to recruit you? I snickered. Most of all the Irish-born natives in the damn state worked for me in some form. He glared at me. I wanted to be the first of my family to do right by the law. Well then, as you can see, we're on our way out. Mel replied, stepping toward me. We will speak to the commissioner at a later time. You both found your way in. I believe you know your way out. Please give Officer Pope and his family my regards. They couldn't speak, and that may have been due to the fact that she looked sinfully beautiful in white, or because Officer Pope and his family were no longer alive. They nodded with rage building in their eyes.
The door slammed once they exited. She turned to me and frowned, straightening my toy again. You know they were lying, right? Yes, and what do we do with lawyers? I asked, my hands on her hips. She smiled as well, reaching into my tuxedo jacket to pull out my phone. Monty, two officers should be leaving the premises. Please make sure to escort them back to the station. You and I both know how tricky those high bridges can be. I watched her mouth as she spoke, and I wanted nothing more than to kiss the breath from her lips. She noticed once she hung up and placed her finger on them. Candy store is still closed. She glared. After all, you wanted to see Vance's face instead. Love. She didn't even allow me to finish before she walked away. Damn it all to hell. Vance better fucking cry and piss in his fucking pants. Melody. Shoot me, please. I groaned as I watched Amory and Sage kiss. It was like they were trying to suck the skin off each other's faces. Not before you shoot me. Liam whispered back. His eyebrows wouldn't stop twitching, and had it only been us, I would have laughed over it. However, it wasn't just us. We were surrounded by at least three hundred of Vance's closest family and friends. The wedding was so boring that Liam and I spent most of our time texting Declan and Neil for updates. But it was game time now. Taking our seat at table five with the rest of the Callahans, we waited for the text message signaling it was done. However, the true fireworks didn't start until Vance got the call. I was tempted to tell them myself. However, Vance still thought I was some little lamb unaware of the world around me. He was a fucking idiot. From Sage's letters, he must have known I was the child spared on the plane. However, he still didn't see me as a threat. Black, red, and white just doesn't seem right for this time of year. Caroline frowned as she looked around the wedding hall. Yes, I replied, looking Olivia up and down. Adding red to the color scheme was a bad choice. Olivia's blue eyes narrowed on me. So is wearing white to another woman's wedding. There are very few people I consider to be women. Sage is a snake, I said, taking a sip of my water. Don't ask what I consider you to be. Evelyn sighed while Liam snickered. Cedric was too busy checking his watch. He was dying to see what was going to happen as well. There's no hope for you two, is there? Evelyn asked Olivia and me. Not if she keeps harming my husband and then forcing him on assignments when he should be by my side, Olivia said. Olivia, snap at me again and you won't have a husband. In fact, I would just as soon kill you and move on. You're not worth anything anyway, so do us all a favor and sit in the corner like a good little trophy. I rolled my eyes at her as Liam's phone went off. Tilting it to me, I watched as a very expensive-looking house, along with one too many cars, went up in flames. The cameras caught every angle of the house, including two women banging on the door, trying to free themselves. And they are? Apparently, Vance and Amory shared two special friends. Liam snickered, and I could see the reflection of fire in his green eyes. That's disgusting. Sage should be thanking me. The thought made me want to puke in my mouth. She's calling someone, Cedric said. Liam and I looked over to him and tried not to laugh. She had switched seats with Evelyn just to see the fucking phone. Evelyn looked to me and winked, drinking her wine. I think I know who, Caroline said, causing us all to follow her gaze to Vance, who was in the middle of giving his son a speech. He glanced at his phone for a moment before going on. It is for this reason I would like to welcome my daughter, Sage Valero, to the family. May she and my son make us all proud. Everyone but us applauded loudly. When Vance gave the microphone to Jane, I believe her name was, Sage's maid of honor, he went to answer his phone. Sadly, it was too late, because Liam and I could see that the woman had passed out, probably due to the smoke. Putting his phone away, Liam took my hand and kissed it as we watched Vance listen to his messages. His back was turned, but the moment he hung up after placing another call, he turned to us. His eyes were wide and deadly. All the emotion he had had during the wedding was gone. All that was left was the monster. It looked like he'd squeezed the phone so hard the screen cracked. Liam smirked and gave him a short nod, as if they were friends. Do you think he's angry? One can only hope, love. Entertaining indeed, 
Cedric sneered, leaning back into his chair. That was only the first course, father. Liam grinned, and I couldn't wait for dessert. Liam. I didn't make a habit of smoking. However, this damn wedding had gone on for far too long. Amory was now fully aware, which meant his new wife was as well. The tension between us, as we pretended to be nothing more than guests, was boiling under the surface. Even the way Sage cut her steak, which was so rare it looked like it was dripping blood, seemed to antagonize us. She glared at Mel with so much hatred even Olivia had to look away. My Mel smiled as if she hadn't noticed. I knew she had, though. The clicking noise under the table as she loaded her gun with one hand was proof enough. So, I took a small smoking break inside the bathroom stall like I was still in high school. Neil and Declan had been my role models until the point my mother found them and beat their asses so badly they couldn't sit. That was the last time either of them smoked. I, on the other hand, had never been caught. Maybe Mel could beat it out of me. Did you see Callaghan's bitch? A voice called out from the other side of the stall. The Italian wench in white? Another replied, as I felt myself freeze. But I wouldn't give to fuck the shit out of her tight pussy. I would ride the fuck out of her until she broke down like a good little cunt whore. Then... He didn't get to finish for the simple fact that I stepped out of the stall and put a bullet in the back of his friend's head. The body fell into the urinal he was pissing in. The man beside him, how dare he call my wife a whore, cunt, and bitch, stood with his pants down in shock. I knew him. He was Amory's best man, Alex. He turned to me, opening his mouth to speak, but I took the liberty of grabbing him by his hair and smashing his head against the marble above the urinal. That Italian wench is my fucking wife! I yelled, using his head as a hammer against the wall. You don't talk of her as you piss! Slam. You don't talk of her, period. You don't call her anything but fucking Mrs. Callahan. Slam. And you sure as fuck don't talk of her with your fucking hand on your dick. Slam. 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 Releasing his head, which was covered in blood and brain matter, I watched as his body fell to the ground. He most likely died after the first two hits in the wall, but all I could fucking see was red. I wanted his head to come off his fucking shoulders. Sighing, I turned to the mirror to find my suit covered in blood. With a groan, I reached into my jacket and pulled out my phone. Eric, I need a new suit as fast as possible. I told him as I washed the blood from my hands. Looking down, I noticed the blood spreading across the marble floor and onto my fucking shoes. Damn it! Get me new shoes as well. Hanging up, I dried my hands and stared at the bodies all around me just as another fool stepped in. He froze, looking first at the blood and then to me. Anger issues, I said to him, reaching for my gun. Step into my office. He tried to turn and run, but I shot him right in the spine and his legs gave out. Guess he won't be stepping anywhere, huh? I asked him, before blowing a hole through his face. Again, the blood spattered onto my hands and I couldn't help but groan once more. Say what you made me do. I asked the dead man before locking the door and rewashing my hands. The worst things happened when you smoked, but thank God for silencers. I thought to myself. Melody When Liam sat back down, he kissed my cheek. I looked him over quickly, and something didn't seem right. Did you change? It looked like the same suit, but only fresher, like he hadn't been wearing it all day. Why would I do that? He asked me, but there was a glint in his eye. Don't play coy with me. He smirked, kissing me once more and whispering, Later, love. So what's next on the menu? Cedric asked as he wiped the corners of his mouth. Evelyn smacked on his chest. Will you stop? You're like a child at Disneyland. Bloody Wonderland, actually. Liam said, his mouth turning up at the corner. I wasn't sure what that meant, but Cedric did and I guess that was all that mattered. Liam and I have to say hello before any more excitement occurs. I smiled as Liam and I stood. Sage and Amory must have had the same idea, because they were walking right to us. We met in the middle of the dining hall. Mr. and Mrs. Valero, congratulations. You and this wedding were beautiful. I smiled, reaching out for Sage's hand. 
Thank you, Mrs. Callahan. Sage smiled back, shaking my hand. And kudos to you for wearing white and not caring what people think of you. My family's opinion is all that matters to me. Which was bullshit because only my opinion, and sometimes Liam's, mattered to me. Yes, our apologies about your father, then. Amory bit his lip at me with lust in his eyes. He reached over to shake my hand, but Liam grabbed his wrist and forced him to shake his. I'm quite possessive, he told him. I'm sorry about your best man. I looked to him confused for a quick moment before Amory and Sage scanned the room quickly. What did you? Thank you so much for the lovely evening. However, Liam and I aren't fireproof. I interrupted. Sage turned to me, confused once more. What? Fire! Someone yelled behind us, and sure enough, flames were breaking out above us. What a shame. You should try to save your gifts. The big one's usually a blender. Liam grinned. The room broke out in panic. The people looked like animals trying to leave a watering hole. They tripped, pushed, and pulled at one another to make it out of the doors. You want war? I will fucking give you war! Amory roared at us. It's always been war. Don't cry just because you're losing. Liam's lips turned up into a slow smile. I'm going to fucking kill you! Sage yelled at us. We're looking forward to seeing you try. Oh, and by the way, I lied. Your dress is hideous. And this wedding? I gestured around me. Well, it sucked so badly that even the devil couldn't stand to look at it. You little! Ma'am, we have to go. A guard of theirs yelled as she pulled them away. Liam and I stared around as the fire spread. Have you both lost your minds? Olivia screamed over the chaos of the room. So many people, so few doors. Liam! Evelyn and Coraline yelled while Cedric watched in glory. He knew we wouldn't be stupid enough to trap ourselves. Enough! Liam snapped at them, and I saw the flames in his eyes again. It turned me on, I couldn't deny that. Taking my hand, we nodded at them to follow us. Everyone was so busy trying to run to the front door, they didn't even notice us. Liam pushed open a small part of the wall we'd had installed after discovering their wedding location. The moment it opened, Declan and Neil stepped through. Coraline and Olivia both ran into their husband's arms, and I felt tempted to roll my eyes. Save it, let's go. The men, being Callahan men, made sure the girls went through first. However, I waited at the door for Liam. He was the last to exit, and as we closed the door, we met the eyes of Vance as his men tried to pull him away. I smiled at him before giving him the middle finger, just as Liam shut it completely. Turning back to me, he grinned. So mature. You're jealous you didn't do it. I nearly let out a giggle as we walked through the underground tunnel. Next time. I really hope he doesn't die. He pouted, looking back as we reached the lake. There was a boat waiting for us. No, he isn't going to die. He's too big of an ass to die so easily. I shared the amusement in his eyes as he helped me onto the boat. I swear you're both pyromaniacs. Declan laughed as he handed us a glass of champagne. Looking back at the mansion behind us, I couldn't help but agree. Where to, sis? Neil yelled from the steering wheel. Olivia hugged him as he moved us further and further away from the home. The city, Liam and I said together. Everyone broke into their own private conversations, giving me time to turn to Liam. It's later. He rolled his eyes. There was a little hiccup in the bathroom. It got messy. I killed two. Three men and had to change. Nothing major. You need to control your temper. I leaned in to kiss him. One of these days I will. Maybe. He kissed me back. Motherfucking day made.